Oh, cool. I guess I'm giving a talk. Okay, rocking. Ooh, I can hear myself. Fancy. Cool. So I am here to talk about the uh, Tower of Babel or Babel. I'm American, so I can't pronounce words. Um, actually, I'm Canadian living in America, so I extra can't pronounce words. Um, and this is about making Apache Spark, Apache Mahout, Kubeflow, Kubernetes, and a few extra friends all play nice together. Um, and now every time I hear Tower of Babel or Babel, I think of the book Snow Crash. Has anyone here read the book Snow Crash? OK. So the three of you are going to love the references that I'm going to make. Uh, for the rest of you, just pretend that I am hilarious um, and that pizza is somehow related to machine learning. Um, also, you should consider reading Snow Crash. It's an excellent book with some weird bits in it. Um, and it makes me very hungry for pizza. So here's a picture of some pizza. So you can be hungry, too. OK. So in addition to not being very good at pronouncing words, my name is Holden. Uh, my pronouns are she or her. It's tattooed on my wrist, which is really convenient in the mornings when I'm just like, what? Where am I? Who am I? Um, and I'm on the Apache Spark PMC. What that means is I'm like a committer, but I'm really, really hard to get rid of. Um, unfortunately, it's not like tenure in the same way uh, as it guarantees that I get money. I can still get fired. Uh, and in fact, I checked my email right before this talk to make sure I wasn't part of that 2%. Um, good, good news. Um, and I contribute to a lot of other projects uh, besides just Spark. Um, previously, I've worked at a whole bunch of other places. I haven't yet quite sort of caught all of the Pokemon um, in the traditional uh, bingo card that you get in, in San Francisco, but I'm confident that before I eventually get hit by a car and die, I will succeed at this. Um, I'm a co-author of a few books, including one that is actually related to this talk, uh, and you should definitely buy several copies of each book. They make an excellent gift for whatever the next holiday is. And this is Europe, so you have tons of holidays. So you should definitely buy tons of these books. Um, you should also follow me on Twitter. And if you like questionable code, you should check out my GitHub. Um, as you can tell by the jokes that I'm making, I may not represent the views of my employer, although they definitely do pay other people to make very interesting jokes. And I'm realizing I should stop talking. Um, we are hiring still. Um, and if you're interested, please reach out, although it's mostly in North America. Um, so if you like paying for health insurance with a credit card, come and talk to me. No? OK. Worth a shot. OK, so in addition to who I am professionally, I'm trans, queer, Canadian, in America on a green card, um, and part of the broader leather community. Now, this is not particularly related. There is no secret Canadian um, out of memory exception debugger ring that they give us, right? Um, it's just, I think it's useful for us to all talk about where we're from so that if we realize that we're all surrounded by folks with very similar backgrounds, we try and get some other people in the room. Um, and it's also actually part of why I come to Europe. It's not just because I enjoy beaches. Um, it's because like, I, I like meeting people from different backgrounds than myself. Um, my co-author is, is not present. Uh, Trevor is a wonderful person. Um, he is based in Chicago. He has a new kid. It's very exciting. Everyone send like happy, warm vibes and maybe getting to sleep sometime this year. Energy towards Trevor. Um, he is the PMC chair of Mahout, which means it is even more difficult to get rid of him. Uh, once again, does not come with any guarantees of money, just really difficult to get rid of. Um, and he's an ASF member. Uh, right now, he's mostly looking after his kid, uh, but he is also trying to import electric tricycles into America. And if anyone happens to be interested in that, which is a pretty long shot, definitely reach out to Trevor. His email is at the end of the talk. Um, and, you know, that's probably a great reason to go and visit Chicago, which is not as nice as here, but does have water. Okay, cool. So what are we going to talk about? So we're going to start with our adventure um, slash case study, but I thought adventure sounded cooler. Um, so act one is going to be getting to know the characters and the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, then we're going to talk about the problem in, in like a little bit more depth. And then we're going to talk about how we solve the problem. Um, and then, I mean, I should use air quotes when I say solve. 
solved, except by the time we solved it, the solution wasn't useful anymore. Um, but that's OK, because we did a bunch of cool things along the way. Uh, and so that's going to be the epilogue. And we'll, we'll talk about the cool things that we can learn from our exciting adventure. OK, who are our friends? Um, besides on Twitter. So, OK, Kubernetes, my second favorite friend. Uh, Kubeflow, who is the main character. And for the three of you in the room who read um, Snow Crash, hero protagonist, um, for the rest of you, that was a hilarious joke. I don't know why those three people aren't laughing, but maybe they're European. Um, and Apache Spark, who is my favorite. But in, in kind of the way that your kid is your favorite, even if they're like maybe not so good at everything, you still like really hope that they're going to succeed this time. That's sort of how I feel about Spark. Um, and Apache Mahout, uh, which is not my kid, and therefore I care a little bit less about. Sorry, Trevor. Um, Apache Mahout is very much Trevor's kid and, and much more important. Um, OK, so I'm going to assume that this is KubeCon. We're, we're several hours into it. You probably know what Kubernetes is. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of skip past that. If you're new to the Kube community, that's awesome. I'm super stoked you're here. Um, and that's really cool. But, but we're not going to we're not going to explain Kubernetes um, in the context of what we need it for in this sort of machine learning thing. Um, how many people have had to work? I uh, sorry have had the opportunity to work with data scientists. OK, cool. How many of you have gotten something like untitled underscore x dot ipython notebook from data scientists? That is almost the same number of hands. OK, and how many of you had that run successfully without needing to install any dependencies? That is no one. Great. OK, and so that is why we are using Kubernetes. Um, also, because running on one computer is slow, and also Kubernetes is cool, and we like money. Uh, so Kubeflow is if someone was like, yo, what about if we like put all this machine learning stuff on Kubernetes. So it's got this cube and flow. Ooh, we're going to make pipelines. It's going to be really cool. Everything is definitely going to work. And you should definitely buy my book about how it works. And we need it because putting together all of these different tools kind of sucks, right? Like, no one really wants to be like sitting around waiting for a job to finish to go and kick off another job to go and kick off another job right no one really wants to like have to think about how they're going to get their data from one tool into another we just want some magical tool to take care of it and kubeflow promises to do that for us we'll find out later that we did have to trade much of our happiness for that but that's okay i trade my happiness for money quite frequently um, the other reason why we need it is because reproducible research. Um, and grad students hate reproducible research almost as much as Grumpy Cat. Um, and Kubeflow is this wonderful opportunity to make it so that we incidentally get reproducible research out of things. If we build them in Kubeflow, we can get these nice pipelines, and we can run them again in the future. Once the grad student graduates, once our coworker wins the lottery, once their shares finish vesting, um, there are some other jokes here, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on. We'll move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, cool. So Spark. How many people are not familiar with Apache Spark? <gasps> four people. You should buy my books. But for you four people, I'm so stoked that you're here. Yay. OK, so Spark is a really cool data processing tool, and it definitely works. 100% of the time, it works. 80% of the time. Um, and so it allows us to do distributed data processing so we can handle data sets that are too big to fit in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so if you find yourself trying to open something in an Excel, and Excel is like, hey, I can't open files from HDFS, that is Apache Spark. We're going we're gonna to make it better. OK, yeah, and we need it because it turns out that um, CT scan images are kind of big and don't fit very nicely in an Excel spreadsheet. And to be honest, they, they don't fit really nicely in a computer. Um, and Spark is able to handle everything from doesn't fit in an Excel spreadsheet all the way to doesn't fit in several computers. Um, on the flip side, Spark does a really bad job of handling fits on a floppy disk. Um, so if you have data that fits on a floppy disk, Spark is probably not for you. 
but you should still buy my book. Okay, Apache Mahout. Oh, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got the, the yes, new logo. Ooh. Don't worry, none of the code has been improved. Um, but the new branding is mm, glorious, glorious, glorious. No, and I, I joke, I joke, actually, much of the code has been improved. Apache Mahout was originally created for MapReduce, you know, kicking it old school. And then Spark came along and people were like, whoa, MapReduce isn't cool anymore. Let's use, you know, Spark. Very happy about that decision, y'all. Um, and so Mahout was like, oh, okay, we should rewrite to Spark. That took several years because people are lazy. Um, and I'm including myself in this, I am lazy too. Um, and uh, then they got a new logo so that you could know that it was new and fancy and ran with the new fancy thing that was about five years old. Okay, <clears throat> so the other thing about Apache Mahout is Apache Mahout is a tiny, tiny little project that refuses to die largely because of Trevor. Trevor is amazing, and if you have ever said to yourself, you know what, I wanna get involved in an open source project, but there's just way too many people in all of these projects. It's gonna be so confusing. I will not know who to talk to. You should get involved in Apache Mahout because you can just email Trevor. He is always the guy to talk to, 100% of the time. I'm joking, there is actually a mailing list, but you can also just email Trevor. It's, it's pretty fast. Sorry, Trevor. Okay, cool. So why do we need it? So we need it because uh, math is hard and uh, the people that wrote Spark, in, including myself, are kind of lazy. And we made some machine learning tools, but then part of the way, along the way, we found out that like people were giving us money anyways, and so like maybe someone else could make the machine learning tools. So we kind of stopped making them. Uh, and so that's why we need Mahout, because we want to do some fancy machine learning type things and some fancy math on top of Spark. Okay, and S3 buckets, how many people here are new to S3 buckets? I'm so sorry, slash congratulations. These are bad, but it's okay. They beat the alternative of doing it ourselves. So we can store data in them, and sometimes we can even read the same data that we stored from it. Not a guarantee, certain terms and conditions do apply, not valid in US East 1. Um, <clears throat> Yes, okay, at least someone likes my cloud jokes. Um, so yeah, they're usually not the most performant, but the alternative is standing up my own HDFS cluster, and if you've ever stood up your own HDFS cluster, you will, too will be very happy to use Amazon S3. Okay, so what is the problem that we're gonna solve? We're gonna solve the problem, which is why we're all wearing masks. Um, to be clear, we don't solve it, we all still have to wear our masks, except for me, because I'm talking. Um, but so the big problem in the early days of COVID was we didn't really have a fast way to detect uh, if someone had COVID. And so we, we wanted to do COVID screening, and we thought, you know what, I have a problem, let's add computers, and then we had two problems. So let's see if we can solve the problems we created for ourselves. The answer is sort of. Okay, so we needed rapid testing. Um, so we're gonna go back to March 2020 when you could not like walk into a Walgreens. Oh crap, you don't have Walgreens here. Uh, boots, the thing with the green plus sign. Pharmacia, you could not walk into the pharmacia and buy a COVID test. Um, so back in March 2020, life was sad. Um, life was very sad here, yes. Life was very sad in America. And we couldn't really figure out like who had COVID and it took way too long. So. Um, oh yeah, and the new rapid tests that we got were about 60% accurate. Oh yeah, slightly better than my average in my non-major subjects. Um, shout out to Google for not checking my GPA. Um, <clears throat> or Netflix too, okay, yeah. And so, really cool, a bunch of people came up with things that were more accurate than 60% and went kind of, you know, kind of fast. Um, ultrasounds were pretty cool, the CT scans, uh, showed a lot of promise. Now, admittedly, uh, the people who said that the CT scan showed a lot of promise were the people who did CT scans. So, like, possibly some bias in the same way that I might tell you Apache Spark is really cool and you should buy my books. Um, so, yeah, best diagnostic tool according to the person selling you the diagnostic tool. So that's great. Um, there were some slight, slight problems with that. 
Um, one of them is cancer. Um, and so it turns out that there's some downsides to getting a bunch of CT scans, uh, and this is radiation. And so to like detect uh, COVID in someone, initially you needed to do a full body, like fairly high dose CT scan, right? And that's, that's not great, especially if you might be doing it multiple times on people, right? I don't know how many people here have taken more than one COVID test. Um, certainly I have a lot more. Yeah, right. So that was definitely like, well, okay, we should, we should see if we can like make something that isn't going to turn the population into like little radioactive people. Um, so instead we could use low dose CT scans, right? And the, the plan was more or less, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go like CSI Miami, which I really hope you have, and we're gonna say enhance, and we're gonna turn this into something that tells us what's going on. Um, and so in comparison, much less radiation, much less chance of cancer, yay! Only problem, we needed science fiction technology. Okay, um, <clears throat> the good thing is, it turns out that some people who were way less lazy than us um, came up with some ideas to denoise images a long time ago. Um, it turns out though that like it's kind of hard and denoising them revolves about 500 gigabytes of RAM um, if we wanted to denoise full like body CT scans. And it turns out that my credit card has what would be described as a low limit. So like that's not happening. Um, and we should like figure out some way to do this without using 500 gigabytes of RAM every time we want to denoise an image. So we figured, okay, you know what? I've got a problem, we'll apply machine learning to it, it'll give us magic technology from the future, everything's great, and we'll run it on Kubernetes, so that'll be cool too. Okay, intermission. Do, 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 do. Okay, no one likes my intermission music. <laughs> okay, ah. so we, we, yeah, wait, oh no. Okay, there we go, yes. So we, we really needed some way to do detection of if people had COVID. The best idea that we had was admittedly from someone selling CT scans, but it seemed like a really good idea. Um, and in fact, there were a whole bunch of people who did uh, collect data on sort of what the scans of people with COVID looked like. Now, to be clear, we were not like, hey, we'll make a model that's gonna like tell you if you have COVID or not. Um, there are a bunch of people who tried to do that, and it turns out they did a really good job of detecting if someone was lying down when they were having a CT scan, uh, because uh, they were much more likely to be lying down in a certain position if they were really sick. Um, and so, yeah, correlation and causation, not the same. But, you know, okay, cool, cool. We've got a data set. We've, we've narrowed our scope of problems, so we're just gonna use machine learning to make the images look better, and then we're gonna give it to a human, so it's not our fault if a bunch of people like uh, don't do so well. One of my goals in life is to not be directly responsible for someone's death. Um, right, okay, cool. So why did we use free and open source software? For one thing, I'm cheap. Uh, for another thing, I, I like using open source. Um, and for another thing, at the time, um, things were not looking great for people who had kind of low limit credit cards, and especially for countries who had kind of low limit credit cards. Um, and the nice thing about free and open source software is like, yeah, it's free. Admittedly, it's only free if you value your time at about zero dollars, but conveniently, that's what I value my time at, um, as does Trevor. Unless my employer is listening, in which case, please continue to pay me money. Um, my time is worth whatever you pay me, plus 10%. Okay, cool. <clears throat> So we had an idea, we were gonna make a pipeline, it was totally gonna to work, everything was great. Um, and because we were also admittedly working on a book at the same time, we were like, you know what would be really cool if we did this with Kubeflow, because Kubeflow could totally solve this problem for us. So we'd take our CT scans, we'd turn them into something that we could do our like fancy science on, um, we'd load them into Spark, and then we'd do our distributed uh, SVD, and then everything would be great, um, and then we could denoise our image, and then in theory, a human could look at it and say like, yeah, this person looks cool, they just have a cold, or like, e this person should not like go outside right now, and they get to go into the special room. Um, cool, so first step, we loaded our data. Um, and so the wonderful thing about being lazy 
is that you search on PyPy before you write code. Um, and so the images were all in a format that we couldn't just directly load into Kubeflow. Great news. Someone had already written a library for it. Because it was in Python, we could just really easily whip up a Python script, make that the first step of our pipeline. And it took the images and dumped them to a PVC. Now, this did have some slight implications for scaling in that no. Um, because we had read write once uh, PVCs, so, so we, were, we were only able to run one instance at a time. But the good news is that the data set at this stage had not yet become the like Holden is very sad stage. So it was OK that this was not happening in parallel, and it was only happening on one node. The next stage is the one where if we weren't doing it in parallel, life would be sad. Um, so we read them in from disk into an RDD. It is kind of annoying to do this in Spark, um, something that we should be doing better because it's reading from a local disk into a distributed disk. One of the things that I really wish was easier was if we could have uh, read write once into read many conversions for PVCs in a happier way, but that's a long story and not particularly related. OK. So, um, and then the DRM thing is not the thing where they didn't want you to listen to music in the 90s uh, or early 2000s. Um, it's some Mahout thing. I think the M stands for Mahout. It might stand for matricy. I don't know. This was the like uh, sciency part, so Trevor did the math part. OK. And then it came time to do our fancy math. Ooh. OK. So SVD is, uh, yeah, that's hard. And um, let's see how many minutes I have left. Yeah, not that many, um, because I don't have four months. So we're not going to go into the details of how we perform an SVD, but suffice it to say, Mahout on Spark can do um, happy SVD, and it's, it's very nice. It does not need 500 gigabytes of RAM on one computer. Everything is great. No rusty spoons required. Um, and if you're interested in actually learning what's going on here, there is a link at the bottom. And these slides are actually also on the schedule link. So you can go to the schedule link, and then you can click on these links so you don't have to write it down or take pictures. Of course, though, like, feel free to take pictures because Boo is fabulous. Oh, yeah, Boo is my dog. OK. So one of the things that happens, though, sometimes when we do things is we're like, you know what we should do? We should see if it worked. And that's like always a mistake, right? That's the first step to sadness. Um, and yeah, so. Yeah, it, it, it was sad. Um, or more specifically, one of the things that we realized is, well, like, yeah, we could just run this iteratively like a whole lot. Uh, we would eventually like go from like kind of OK image to like slightly better image all the way back to kind of crappy image. Um, and so like humans, humans need to do things, and we can't just give the magic computer box the magic button and everything gets better, um, in part because we don't have like a good enough fitness definition of you know what a good image is. Like that's kind of humans. Okay, cool. So um, we we did have this pipeline. It cleaned up a bunch of images. What what happened? Um, or you know what came out of doing all of this stuff? So before like these results were published. The world changed, and and for the better, to be clear, right? Like if we were all getting CT scans, you know, before getting on an airplane, that would kind of suck. Um, tests got cheap, a lot cheaper than the cost of doing CT scans, and they got more accurate than sixty percent. Um, so pretty solid. So just like a real software project, in the time that we finished, it was no longer useful. But you know there, there were a bunch of really neat things that sort of came out along the way. Um, one of them is like there was this idea in the early 2000s that we could do this like futury sciency thing, and we could clean up these images. Um, there was a published paper, not enough code to like actually really just like go and run it, but we were actually able to recreate it, and that's kind of cool, right? And like reproducible science is like yay, it's it's happy, right? Grumpy cat and grad students might disagree, but that's okay because Grumpy Cat is not the principal investigator. Um, right, OK. We also, like along the way, discovered that running Spark on Kubernetes is a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is part of how I have a job. Um, so one of the things that we discovered is that 
um, we didn't have a shuffle service on, on Cube, and so we worked on some alternatives, um, and I changed jobs in between. E yeah. Um, and the first alternative that we came up with was this kind of janky decommissioning thing where we copied files around. Um, then one of my coworkers came up with another, even smarter thing, where we would copy files around, and then if like things went to hell, we'd copy them into an object store, and we could still scale to zero, uh, or not quite zero. We could scale to one uh, because there was certain information that we couldn't manage to get out of the JVM. Oh yeah, we use Java. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> Other exciting things that were admittedly unrelated, but were pain points that we experienced uh, that have been improved um, is pod allocation um, for our scale down is kind of flaky um, and scale up. So we're scaling down and back up and down and back up. Um, and this happens a lot when we're doing things like switching from ETL to uh, the machine learning phase. Um, really excited that Volcano and Unicorn support is now in Spark. Um, I think it's being voted on right now, although it did just get a minus one uh, during the previous talk. So like, ye no, no, no like hard commitment on when it's gonna be available. But if you like building from source, oh yeah. You can, you can play with it. Uh, and then NVIDIA folks did some wonderful things with making it so that the training and ETL stages can use different types of resources. Um, instead of just like having a different number of machines, uh, Spark can actually take advantage of the fact that Kubernetes can allocate pods on different machines with uh, different kinds of resources. Um, the other one is that we got an example for our book, which once again, you should all buy. And one of my co-authors is actually here in the, in the road if you wanna, yeah. So you should buy it so that we can each afford more coffee. Um, and you should buy several, several copies. Um, but yeah, there's, there's the example on GitHub, you can check it out. And it's a full pipeline, it's not just like an IPython notebook and a note that says, good luck, have fun. Um, right. You should buy these books. Uh, they're great for the holidays and make an excellent gift. Um, there is also the, the article that came out of it. I get no money from the article. Do not care if you read it. Um, the book, though, yeah, that's where the money is. OK, cool. So what, what could we have done better, right? Like if I had a time machine or if I was solving this problem again today, let's hope we don't have another pandemic, um, what, what could we do better? So Kubeflow makes using all of these different tools possible, right? And that's kind of cool, right? We have all of these different tools stitched together, and it's really cool. The only, the only problem is it's also kind of slow. We end up writing data out to disk or S3, respectively, between each of these tools. And it turns out that the only thing slower than disk is distributed disk. That's not actually true. Tape is slower than distributed disk. But you know, it's, it's not a fun time, right? Um, it's not able to help us turn our non-distributed tools into distributed, right? So like if we have something that isn't already parallelizable, it, it's not gonna be able to like make it a party for us. Um, it is gonna be able to schedule it on like a really big chunky machine for us, so that's kind of cool, but like it's not, it's not gonna magically make PyDecom run on three machines at the same time. So how could we make this like suck less? Right? There's a whole bunch of different things that we could do. The first one is we can avoid writing to disk. Um, and, and technically, we could do this with Kubeflow pipelines because we can return anything. But this is the same sort of technical wherein technically everything's a Turing machine. So yeah, you can, but like no one's going to. Um, we could move like our parallelization uh, stuff up the stack. So right, instead of just using Spark to parallelize things, we could see if whichever workflow tool we were using gave us some ability to parallelize more things. And there's probably a bunch of other things that we could do. Oh, by the way, also, this is my dog. His name is Professor Timbit. Um, <clears throat> for some reason, Trevor left him off the paper. <laughs> but he is included in the book. And if you buy a copy, you can see another picture of him. <laughs> Um, right, okay, so probably we could do more things, but as, as mentioned before, I am very lazy. Um, and right, so, so we, the other thing is we have three standards, right? We've got like these three different tools. The solution is to make another tool. Does anyone remember that XKCD? For copyright reasons, it's not included, but if you don't remember it, you should definitely go look it up because that's, that's what we did. 
or another book, right? The software engineering thing. Ugh. It does pay a lot more than books, but right, we could we could make some some new books or you know these these tools. So we can use Ray Distributed to make using multiple tools less expensive, um, and we can do this because Ray is able to represent the data in an internal uh, Apache Arrow in memory format using its uh, object store called Plasma, which has a nice shared memory interface. And if any of you have used shared memory before, you know by when I say nice, I mean dumpster fire, but contained dumpster fire. Um, so it's really good, really fast. Um, so we could, we could make using these multiple tools less expensive. So we could use Ray to stitch our things together instead of just depending on Kubeflow pipelines. Uh, we could also just try and have less tools um, and we could do that by doing things in Dask. And for example, Dask has a dis uh, distributed uh, SVD, as well as having the ability to distribute the PyCom stuff. So we could you know, use something like Dask so we have less tools to stitch together. And even though every tool that we stitch together is still going to be kind of expensive, there's, there's less of them going on. Um, but regardless, the answer is buying more of my books. <clears throat> OK. So you might be saying to yourself, Holden, that sounds great. I will, of course, buy those books that you mentioned on the previous slide, but should I still buy your Kubeflow book? And the answer is yes. Um, and so this is because Ray and Dask don't solve everything. Um, specifically when it comes to the level of isolation that we're able to get, um, Ray and Dask make it really easy for us to use different versions of Python libraries, but if we ever have to deal with like different versions of CUDA or like different native libraries, our life is going to be really, really sad. And we'll want to use something like Kubeflow to do the coordination instead of trying to use Ray or Dask, which have a much tighter integration. Um, other things is serving. Um, the Ray people, if you're watching this talk, I'm sorry. So you can do serving with Ray. You probably shouldn't. Um, or if you do, you're going to have an exciting learning opportunity, which is going to give you an exciting opportunity to give a talk about all of the things that went wrong with building a serving system in Ray. Uh, so you, you, you can do it, and you can fix those bugs because it's open source. So please do. Um, on the other hand, if you are in any way judged for your performance instead of hours worked, consider not doing that. Um, and you can use something like Selden for serving, which is like much happier. And I say this because I think one of the Selden people is in this room, and I'm not sure if the Ray people are in this room. Um, <clears throat> okay, also hyperparameter tuning. So okay, yeah, there's a whole bunch of really lovely tools that we get with Kubeflow that we don't really get with Ray or Dask. They're sort of more designed to make these things parallelized and less focused on the fancy machine learning bits. Um, so that's, that's the party there. Cool. Also, if you've ever said to yourself, Holden, this sounds terrible. How can I get my children involved? Have I got the answer for you? You too can teach kids about the magic of Kubeflow with Cubes Flow Place. Palace? What? No, place. They should have called it palace. Whatever. Um, it is available now on the internet, and unlike all of the other books, it's free, which is clearly a mistake. But before they realize this mistake, you should go and download that PDF and show it to your children to save them from a life of software engineering. Um, alternatively, if you know kids who do not have your home phone number, you could teach them the magic of Spark with distributed computing for kids, which will be available for values of soon, um, which are similar to when I will do my assignments, which is soon. Um, and you can teach them the wonders of Spark. And then later on, if you make the mistake of giving them your phone number, you can teach them the wonders of out of memory exceptions. Yes. Not me. Oh, I should take my phone number off the internet. Oh, dear. OK. Um, <clears throat> anyways, so that's, that's it for, for the talk. I would really love any live questions. Alternatively, if you're shy and you don't like asking questions of the person wearing the fabulous dinosaur dress in person, um, you can always email me. Thank you, one person who clapped. It means the world. Um, you can also email Trevor. Trevor is delightful and will answer questions about the math things, electric 
bike imports into Chicago and whether or not he has slept. Oh, and also, also, this is totally only tangentially related. He proposed to his wife in the book that we wrote together in the, in the preface, and, and she said yes, and now they have a kid. And so I feel, in a very small way, partially responsible for this, and you too can feel partially responsible by buying several copies. Oh, yeah. does, does anyone have any questions? That looks like a no. Oh, did I go over time? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'll be around um, because I am cheap, and I think there's free drinks. Um, I hope. I hope. Someone told me there were. If they were lying to me, I would be very sad. I'm going to go try and find free things to drink and eat, and you can come and find me. Um, if there's another person wearing a dinosaur dress, please introduce me. Otherwise, you can just look for me by my dinosaur dress.